a Notre Dame hand. Thank you very much. Your Excellency Bishop Darcy, Father Hesburgh, Father Joyce, members of the CSC Order, members of the Board of Trustees, fellow honorary degree recipients, graduating class of 1985, parents and friends. It is indeed a genuine privilege to come to this university where such a diversity of human wisdom is taught, discussed, and learned. Let us reflect on the problems related to bringing peace, freedom, and social justice to the world and to my country. I am sure these are the issues which have caught the attention of all free men in America. We will talk about realities in El Salvador and about our democratic revolution. As president of El Salvador, I want to talk to you about our struggle to achieve the goals of democracy. Throughout the last four years, the people of the United States have generously supported our efforts in El Salvador to divorce ourselves from the repression and cruelty of the past and bring new life to democracy in this hemisphere. Today, I bring good news to you. Democracy has been born in El Salvador. It is healthy and growing stronger. In the last three years, Salvadorians had the opportunity of deciding between the policies of the past and those of the future, between governments controlled by a few and a government controlled by the voters. In all occasions, the voters spoke with one voice and with one purpose, confirming their dedication to peace, to freedom, to social justice, and democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, I come in 1985 to express my thanks for the recognition the university is granting me, the conferral of the degree Honoris causa means you have considered that I have tried to practice the lessons that I learned here at Notre Dame. I am here as a representative of my country, of the millions of people of El Salvador who have suffered the tyranny of dictatorship for the past 50 years, who have suffered injustice and lack of freedom. I come as the constitutional president of my country, freely elected, to carry out humane and Christian principles and to mold social disciplines based on justice, liberty, and democracy. You have acknowledged my efforts in striving to reach the objectives of social peace as dedicated by the church and still in you and in me in this university. It is for me a great honor to be back at Notre Dame. Under the cloak of the Notre Dame du Lac and the Golden Dome, symbols of our tradition at Notre Dame. For the moment I entered the university as a student in 1944, I began to feel what would later serve as the basis for my conduct 
and guide the destiny of my life. I left San Salvador at that time when my country was in crisis. The totalitarian government then in power has forced many young men, such as me, to consider going to Guatemala to join Dr. Arturo Romero, the leader of the democratic movement of our country. When my father sent me to study in the United States, I passed through Guatemala, and I too consider staying and fighting with the opposition. I might well have died, as many of them did, in the Battle of Aguachapan, if Dr. Romero has not insisted I come and study in the United States. In route, a Salvadoranian companion and I stopped in St. Louis, Missouri, and young men that we were decided to have a few beers at a bar. <laughs> I did too, did it. <laughs> we were joined by some young Americans who were also having beer there, and we struck a conversation. One of them asked us, where are you headed? My friend, I didn't speak any English, my friend who spoke English answered, we're going to Notre Dame. The American smiled and, and then responded, well, now Notre Dame is importing football players from South America so that they can... <laughs> so that they can beat Army and Navy. <laughs> and that year, I didn't know what the football meant to Notre Dame. And when I came to campus, I tried to play it. <laughs> I went on a freshman team. I saw it was easy. You just get the ball and start rolling. <laughs> so I got the ball, start running, and all of a sudden, a million pound got over me, <laughs> and that was the end of my football. <laughs> I did not know then that Notre Dame was a university famous for its football team, but I soon came to understand what the export prestige of Notre Dame meant that the meaning of the fighting Irish transcended the mere sport dimension underlying the Notre Dame education, scientific tradition, and social values. The day I arrived at the university, I saw this great and beautiful fields and wonderful forest. My first impulse was to run across the lovely grass the then perfect discipline, Father Joseph Quijo, saw me in the middle of the field and called me. He stared intensely at me and scolded me. But all I heard was a torrent of words that didn't mean anything to me. <laughs> but Father Quijo's face and attitude all said one thing. What kind of a person are you? Don't you understand that the university's beauty must be protected? That you may not stop a step on the grass? That you must discipline yourself and respect the university rules and principles? This was my first lesson at Notre Dame. <laughs> that was 40 years ago. That was way back when I don't know how many things have changed now in Notre Dame, but uh, now that we are co-eds, I would like to be delighted to, to look around in summer. <laughs> During my student days, I came to understand the need for a system of discipline that established the city limit open to us, the in and out hours, or what, in difficult English for me, 
you call, and now you have to excuse me to ask once again how you pronounce this word to Father Hesburgh. How is it, Father? Parietal. 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 All right. It's parietal, he says. <laughs> The norms of conduct and daily inspections. <laughs> Another anecdote concerned my first religion class, the professor, Father Hesburgh, of course, a very young priest, spoke to us about apologetic religion, philosophy, and theology. Thanks to the language barrier, I did not understand a word he was saying. <laughs> And in need of help, I asked my friend to translate. The young priest saw me speaking to my neighbor while he expounded on the such important matters. He pointed to me and, and said, uh, what's your name? And I came up and said, Napoleon Duarte. And he said, Napi, if you continue talking in class, I'm going to throw you out of the window. <laughs> I've been happy ever since to Father Hesburgh. <laughs> when class was over, Father Ted motioned to me and said, where were you talking in class? And in my best eight days, all English, I said, uh, to understand what you're saying, I need help. His expression changed. And he said, Nappy, pay a lot of attention and, ne and learn English fast because you're going to need it. <laughs> Those past my years are not a name. Much like yours, learning, studying, worrying. The workload seemed never ending, and we managed to pull all some all nighties. <laughs> Quite a feat on those days when lights out was strictly enforced at 10 p.m. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be a matter of getting up an hour before mass to do some last minute cramming. Then, there was the other kind of work, the kind that makes end meet. I worked variously as a waiter in the dining room, washing dishes in the kitchen, ironing clothes in laundry, washing windows in summer. Just as I am sure you have done, I spend a lot of time thinking about how demanding my professors were. But in retrospect, after near 40 years, I can tell you it was worth the hard work. The day I received my diploma, as you will today, I left the university full of enthusiasm ready to show the world what I had learned in technical fields of engineering. At that point, I had not re yet realized the importance of the other education I received, the one that deals with values and discipline, and the principles of tradition that I had been given at Notre Dame. But the lessons did not end with my graduation. When Father Hesbert arrived in Central America for the first time on August 12, 1960, he called together the alumni and spoke to us on the roles that we, as domers, were called to play in society. <laughs> he insisted on the responsibilities we had in serving our community and asked me specifically, Napi, do you remember the values we spoke about in our religion class? Our discussion on the social justice, the dignity of men, the social doctrines of the church? I remember that he said, you cannot stand with your arms folded and believe that you are acting patriotically if all you do is construct bridges, buildings, and roads. You have an ethical commitment with yourself you have a moral commitment to Notre Dame. You have a historical commitment to your country. Today, I stand here accountable to you. For 25 years, I have thought to spread the message 
that when God created man in the image and likeness, he did so because he wanted men to live in harmony with society, not isolated from it. For this reason, he gave men the gift of love, understanding and charity with which to strengthen the goods in the world and compensate for the evil. Selfishness. <laughs> Selfishness. Ambition. Envy. The seven capital sin had given rise to and conditioned the historical foundations not only of my people, but of humanity as well. This social structure had left its imprints in my country, on Latin America, and on the rest of the world. The new generation that today assumes leadership inherits a world in which might makes right, and where violence rules rather than reason, thereby indicating that we have learned nothing from history. Contemporary social dichotomy has divided humanity along ideological and economical lines. I had confronted nation against nation in the power of a struggle of the world hegemony. Today's world has produced widespread terrorism. The disrespect of our life and social discipline allows for the decomposition of the social process. Anarchy has reached every nation, injecting fear and hopelessness into the life of humanity. From an economical point of view, the financial crisis that we are undergoing affects nations rich and poor. Economic dependency, however, has cast industrialized countries against those of the third world, which are forced to bear the consequences of our dependency.